Okay, welcome to the quest for truth. This may not seem like biology for you, but um, there's a whole lot of uh, philosophy and scientific methodology that goes into biology, and I think what we're after, of course, in any sciences is validity and truth. So, um, what we're going to look at is basically the history, both in biology, probably in life, of um, this quest for truth. The hope here is that uh, as you look at in this first unit a whole lot of, uh, ah, we'll call it evidence, things like Kitty Wumpus, um, other labs that you will do in the course, what you're really after here is to become skeptical of all information. Um, that could even be information from teachers, certainly from the internet, and to actually look for some sort of corroborating evidence that um, we are justified in calling that data truth. So, let's move on. The study of living creatures has always fascinated man. What has changed over time, however, is his methods of investigating that life. With Anton van Leeuwenhoek, work with lenses and the microscope opened up a new world of exploration. Suddenly an entire universe of unknown life was available simply for the looking. We can't really overestimate the impact that the microscope had on uh, scientific advancement. Suddenly this universe was uh, being expanded both on the small and the large as we had telescopes, we had microscopes. We were looking at suddenly um, millions of things that never were available to anybody else on this planet up until that point in history. So the microscope is a huge tool in the quest for truth. Um, we've come a long way in that quest. Today's electron microscopes obviously are looking at uh, life that is incredibly smaller than anything Anton van Leeuwenhoek ever looked at. Suddenly this technological tool, the microscope, allowed people to make better scientific observations. Sometimes these observations were creatures that, well, they just as soon not have ever seen. Consider, for example, a dust mite. This creature lives in your bed feeds off dead and decaying skin, regardless how many times you wash your sheets, he's still going to be there. Well, I don't necessarily agree with everything about these dust mites. Uh, the one that might jump off the page right off here is this eight-legged insect, uh, which you will, of course, realize as you move through this course that if it's got eight legs, technically it's not a member of class Insecta. Um, but hey, um, it does give you pause to think about the little things that are around in our life. We haven't even got to the bacteria yet, but uh, I should mention at the outset that by the time you finish this course, chances are uh, uh, you're going to think you're dying of uh, a whole lot of different diseases because there is a lot of life and it lives in you and on you, and uh, normally it's not a problem. So we mentioned that this microscope uh, has taken us a long way. Just out of curiosity, this is a very early uh, ad for microscopes. Everybody was so excited about looking into this new universe that they were buying them in the equivalent of Sears catalogs. And um, the point here is, though, that this was simply one tool that was leading us towards uh, truth. And that brings us back to the question, uh, what is truth? We know that biology is the science of life. We know that science is a body of facts that man has gathered by observing the physical universe. These definitions tend to lead one into the other. And just what is the point of doing scientific observation? Isn't it that science is really after facts? There's the rub. Just what is truth? And how does one know that a supposed fact is true? Obviously the answer to this one isn't going to ever be a complete one. You see, this is a question that has kept the world's best scientists busy for thousands of years. Let's look at some of the most commonly accepted theories about just what truth is. Truth. What everybody believes. 
For much of modern medical history, everybody simply believed Hippocrates and his doctrine of humors. The cause of disease was considered by the Greeks to be morbid influences on the body's humors. Blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. It followed that many illnesses could be diagnosed by examining the body's discharges and by treating them accordingly. Not only your health, but your personality and behavior was determined by these humors. Someone who was phlegmatic had too much phlegm and was given to sloth. Someone with too much blood, for instance, loved wine, women, and music. Somebody who had too much black bile would be melancholy, and on and on it went. By the end of the 15th century, this belief in the doctrine of humors had made uroscopy, or the examination of urine, probably the chief form of diagnosis, and it had elevated bloodletting to the status of a universal treatment. So fashionable were these treatments that physicians amassed fortunes in their applications. You can tell who the physicians are in this manuscript from 1482 in a physician's office. They are the ones that are well-dressed. They are the ones that are making money. Um, everybody else, of course, is having some body fluid that corresponded to one of the four uh, fluids that Hippocrates mentioned removed from their body. Blood in this case. This looks like a flask of urine. Um, not sure what this gentleman is losing over here. The doctrine of humors was something that everybody believed, and this belief permeated all life. Even English literature, one of the first great writers, Geoffrey Chaucer, writes in the Canterbury Tales of one who, quote, knew the cause of every malady, were it of hot or cold, moist or dry, and were engendered, and of what humor. Keep in mind that Chaucer lived over 1,700 years after Hippocrates. So this, again, is an example of truth. Um, Hippocrates and his truth carrying over all the way until uh, basically the 18th century. I mean, today we still talk about people being out of humor. Okay, this picture, of course, is for any Americans we may have in our audience because this is uh, the first president of the United States, George Washington. On the evening of December the 13th, 1799, George Washington's doctor noticed that he looked pale and he was not feeling well. And of course, because he was a follower of the tradition of uh, Hippocrates and the doctrine of humors, um, the method of choice for fixing George was to take a pint of blood. So George is um, bled for a pint and then for some reason or other they notice that he doesn't seem to be getting any better. A few more of the best scientists and doctors in the land are brought in and they decide to take another pint and for some reason or other George is still looking really kind of pale and not turning the corner at all so they take a third pint. So this is a picture of him on of course his deathbed because that third pint was um, yeah basically what killed the first president of the United States. So this is a case where, again, truth, or what we believe to be truth, can have some pretty serious consequence. And what better way to remove excess fluid or humor from off the brain than to chisel a hole through the middle of the skull? Keep in mind that this trephining often resulted in death, as the skull on the right clearly shows. Now and again, however, as the skull on the left shows, the patient actually regrew bone tissue and survived. So, the doctrine of humors was the accepted medical practice for centuries. To us, perhaps it sounds silly, but certainly not to the Greeks. And Socrates, Aristotle, Plato were no dummies. Until just a few hundred years ago, almost everyone who was educated believed it. But is it true? The fact that the answer to a math problem is right does not mean that the problem has worked correctly.
The Doctrine of Signatures comes from the idea that God in His wisdom would never leave us on planet Earth without having given us plants for whatever sickness or disease that we were suffering from. Suffering from a liver disorder? Take liverwort. God must have designed this plant to look like the lobes of a liver for any such liver problem. Similarly, Similarly, if you're suffering, if you're suffering from, a from a bladder disorder, disorder you should take bladder wart. Again, the plant is shaped somewhat like the shape of a bladder, therefore God must have intended you to use bladder wart. We're going bald. Try a little hairy cap moss. Rub that into the scalp. Chances are you're going to see some growth of hair. Of course, the reason that you're going to see some growth of hair has nothing to do with the hairy cap moss, just like the bladder wart and liver wart. Um, you know, rarely had any beneficial uh, effects on their patients. Um, you rub hairy cap, cap moss into your head or any other uh, vegetation just because of the massaging action, chances are you're going to increase circulation and you just may increase hair growth. For example, this illumination from a 1505 prayer book shows roses which were used for eye and heart disorders and lilies used for burns. By the way, if you're interested in this particular prayer book, you can get this one the last time I checked for the Rothschild prayer book. It is about $14.6 million, so step right up. So let's go back to that. Just to, uh, yeah, to summarize what was happening there with that doctrine of signatures, because something works or appears to work doesn't make it true. There's probably a whole lot of other reasons, other variables involved in these experimental situations that might account for the uh, result. So we have had a couple of uh, attempts at explaining um, truth and let's move on to another one. I, I say Truth is simply that, which is logical. 2 plus 2 equals 4. Now that's the truth. It's good old logic. My thanks to uh, my daughter, of course, when she was about 8 years old. She seemed to enjoy uh, doing voiceovers and that sort of thing. Eh? So, Never had the heart to get rid of that just because, hey, it's a fond memory. Anyhow, when we talk about logic, a lot of people will say that if something is logical, then it's the truth. Um, before we look at just what that leads to, let's consider that there's two types of logic. Well, more than two, but uh, there's at least two. One is called inductive, where we take observed facts and we come to a general conclusion. And then there's another type where I have deductive logic, uh, where we take a general principle and move on to particulars. If we were in the classroom, I would probably at this point drop a pencil and I would say, okay, um, hey, look at this. Every time I drop this pencil, it heads in one direction, down. Look at that. I drop it again. It's going down. Amazing. By induction, I'm going to come to the conclusion that if I drop anything near the surface of the earth, it's always going to drop in the direction that we call down. So that's inductive. But what about deductive? Deductive reasoning would say, hmm, there's this dude called, um, I believe it was Galileo or Newton, um, basically said that uh, any object is going to accelerate towards the surface of the Earth at 9.8 meters per second per second just due to gravity. Um, we're going to give Newton credit for this. Anyhow, um, it's unfortunate that in high school science courses we tend to do a whole lot of science of the deductive kind. We tell you what's supposed to happen and then you're just supposed to look for evidence that it did in fact happen. I would say that the majority of great scientific discoveries have happened by people just playing around, noticing trends and coming up to some sort of inductive general conclusion. Anyhow, we missed the point. Moving on to what the problem is with truth and logic. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. This first line is called the premise. 
and what follows from it is a conclusion. This conclusion to me makes perfectly good sense. Apples are red, apples are firm. That's my premise. This is firm, but not red, so therefore this is not an apple. Perfectly good logic, but not true. How about this? This is firm and red. This red ball is an apple. No, it's not. Again, logical, but not true. So be careful with logic. If your premise is wrong, your conclusions are not going to be trustworthy either. Now, now, science would teach us the truth is repeated observation. Basically, the idea of spontaneous generation was that organisms were created out of the waters of the earth. Every time it rained, um, you would basically see a whole lot of birds flying out of trees. You'd see a lot of animals uh, moving through the grass. Uh, John Needham did an experiment where he put broth containing a lot of nutrients in a flask and he just left it on the counter. Yea, and behold, when he comes back in two or three weeks, there's a whole lot of life in there. God must have spontaneously generated that life. Um, you can try this for yourself sometime if you have a hunk of raw meat and you want to hang it out on your back porch for a month. Um, come back in a month, you're going to notice a whole lot of little white things. Maggots just squirming through it. Um, black flies lay the eggs in the meat. The black flies hatch. The larvae eat the meat. Um, in this generation, in Needham's time, we would have called that spontaneous generation. And of course, it's not true. Such observations, Such observations led, to the, led to the idea the truth must be spontaneous generation. God must, God must be spontaneously creating organisms out of nothing. Before Louis Pasteur, it was actually widely believed that non-living things could produce living, living organisms. This, of course, is what I was just talking about, spontaneous generation. And it was actually proposed by a very intelligent chap by the name of Aristotle uh, way back in about 384. Um, Jean-Baptiste von Helmont, we're looking at about 1580 to 1640 here for von Helmont, he continued promoting this idea with his suggestion that mice come from dirty rags and rotting grains. So you could try that too sometime. Get a bunch of dirty rags, throw a bunch of grain in there, a bunch of seeds, eh, wait about 21 days, and you know what? You just might see some mice in there. And yeah, the first person to challenge the idea of spontaneous generation was Francesco Reddy in about 1640, uh, Reddy performed a now famous meat maggot, maggot experiment, the one I mentioned earlier, um, and his work disproved spontaneous generation for large organisms. Of course, it took the work of Louis Pasteur to completely disprove the idea that non-living things can produce living organisms. So we can now check off spontaneous generation as an untruth. By the way, um, this isn't a bad little diagram to kind of, uh, you know, think about. Because if you have, uh, yeah, well, I'll let you think about it, okay, without the explanation. Let's move on. What's another historic type of truth? In fact, these are probably some of the ones that you would say you are um, a believer in. Truth is a matter of faith. Faith in your doctor? Faith in your pastor? How about faith in a judge, the law? Or faith in a politician? So, so is truth, is truth that, is that which is accepted by faith? The problem here, problem is, here is you can be sincere but sincerely wrong in your faith. You ever have faith, you ever in, have your faith in your doctor and find out your doctor had made a mistake? How about or how about faith in your local politicians? No, I'm afraid, no, I'm afraid faith, alone faith alone is simply, is simply not, not going, going to lead us to truth. So, 
what do you think? Um, what is truth? Do you agree with uh, any of these options that we that we've presented? Do you disagree with them all? Um, I'd be curious just what you think. These are the kind of questions that, you know what, you don't really have to turn anything in here, but maybe when for this unit we have that hot seat interview and we go through uh, what you're supposed to learn out of this unit. Um, I just